This week on Jerusalem Dateline, the battle for Mosul begins, but where will it end? Plus, Clinton or Trump, who's better for Israel? We'll ask Israelis. And a terror victim who forgives her attackers. And thousands come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical Feast of Tabernacles. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. It's Sukkot in Jerusalem. Later in the program, we'll go to the streets of the city and join thousands of Christians from all over the world who are participating in the annual Jerusalem Parade during the Feast of Tabernacles. But first to Iraq, where Iraqi and Kurdish forces are continuing their offensive against Mosul, captured by ISIS in the summer of 2014. The military campaign against ISIS is just the start of a much larger battle about who will control Iraq's second largest city. The sounds of battle surrounded Mosul as Iraqi and Kurdish forces launched their push into the city. Kurdish fighters seen here have captured at least seven villages just outside Mosul. The Kurdish Peshmerga seem eager to help free the city. Today, now we're gonna fight until we die. The enemy has clearly shown it's ready to die. This ISIS suicide bomber blew himself up after driving into this Iraqi tank. Iraqi and Kurdish forces are receiving help from the 101st Airborne and U.S. airstrikes. U.S. commanders pledge a difficult but successful conflict. This may prove to be a long and tough battle, but the Iraqis have prepared for it and we will stand by them. The Iraqi security forces and the coalition are not only fighting for the future of Iraq, we are fighting to ensure the security of all of our nations. But the various forces trying to capture Mosul hold different agendas. That wrinkle raises the question, who controls Mosul when the battle is over? That's a good question. Mm. That is the question. What happens after the fall of Mosul? Retired U.S. Colonel Richard Nabb told CBN News the military campaign is just the beginning. The critical part is afterwards. You can take Mosul militarily. I think that's the easier piece in my view. It's the part about uh, the political solutions afterwards that need to be meaningful. While the future of Mosul remains unclear, the ISIS dream of a caliphate is crumbling. Their recent loss of the symbolic town of Dabak means ISIS needs a new storyline. According to Islamic prophecy, Dabak was to be the site of an end time battle. Joining me to talk more about Mosul and the U.S. elections are CBN correspondent Julie Stahl and CBN senior editor John Waggy. You know, when I was up there, John and Julie, it's, you just realize the, the profound uh, ramifications of what's happening up there. So what, what are the implications, not only for Iraq, but for the rest of the region? Well, what's happening is, is said in the, uh, in the piece, the military campaign actually might be the easier part. The harder part is the political campaign afterwards. And all these parties vying over who's going to control Mosul and that part of Iraq and Syria for that matter, because really you, you need to think of it as one larger theater, Syria and Iraq, the part of ISIS uh, controlled area. Well, Chris, you also have not only the players immediately in that region, but then you have the superpowers. You have the United States, you have Russia trying to occupy the Middle East. You also have Iran right next door, which is mm -hmm. attempting to go nuclear. So it really could be an un unpredictable kind of powder keg, I would think. So Chris, th we're talking about the Middle East. Why should mm -hmm. Americans care about it? And where mm -hmm. is it going to end? Well, Americans should care about it because it's gonna impact Americans uh, directly because First of all, the United States has had a presence here in the Middle East, and right now they're leaving a vacuum. The people that are filling that vacuum are the Russians and the Iranians. These are enemies of the United States, so it's really going to have a direct impact on Americans. And where is it going to go? Uh, a lot of people don't know, but they are saying that this season right now of the offensive against Mosul is just a prelude to a much more dangerous season when you have all these actors, all these major powers vying for what's happening in the Middle East. And, and John and Julie, the next big thing on the agenda right now is the U.S. elections. And a lot of Israelis are asking the question, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, who's better for Israel? 
It may not be a major concern for Americans, but for Israeli Americans living here in the land, it's a profound question. Despite all the troubles around them, Israelis are paying close attention to the U.S. election process. If you look at the nightly news or any of the daily newspapers, it's often the lead story. Israeli politicians and government officials tend to stay out of American politics. They may have their preferences, but will have to work with whoever the American people choose in the end. But Israelis definitely have an opinion about who would be best for Israel. Hillary, she is very, very supportive of Israel. She understands the need for Israel to uh, maintain its identity as a Jewish state and the need for its security. With Donald Trump, I just don't know. Donald Trump, and, and the reason is, first of all, that he has uh, set up a special team to deal only with Israel-related policy matters. And when you look at the other side, you get Obama. According to an opinion poll released in September, Israelis have mixed feelings. 43% preferred Hillary Clinton, compared to 34% for Trump. But when asked specifically who would be better for Israel, 38% answered Trump, while 33% said Clinton. Expert on U.S.-Israel relations Dan Pfefferman says Israelis want a president who would take a stronger stance on global threats like Iran and ISIS. Given the very strong support towards Israel from the Republican Party over the past two decades, and given the more critical tone from the Democratic Party towards Israel over the past uh, decade or more, Israelis today generally tend to prefer and feel more comfortable with Republicans than they do with Democrats. And it's interesting that in this election, uh, those roles seem to be reversed and more Israelis prefer Clinton. Pfefferman and others believe that's because Clinton is a known commodity. Sheldon Schorer is former head of Democrats abroad in Israel. He says the estimated 200,000 Americans living here who are eligible to vote in U.S. elections generally lean more conservatively than their Jewish counterparts in the U.S. In recent years, there's been a, uh, an immigration into Israel from America, and mostly are by committed uh, Jews, American Jews, to whom the, being Jewish is important. Many of them live in the settlements. So where the democratic policies under President Obama have been somewhat hostile to settlement activity, naturally they would gravitate towards the Republicans. Mark Zell, head of Republicans abroad in Israel, believes the number is much higher, saying some 85 percent of Americans here vote Republican. You see this pin, Trump 2016. I'm getting every day people are coming up to me, ordinary Israelis, who have no right to vote, and giving me a hug or telling me in, quietly in secret, you know, giving me the thumbs up. Although it's questionable how much of an impact absentee ballots have on U.S. elections, Many of the voters here come from important swing stakes like Florida, and that might just tip the scales. Well, John and Julia here to talk more about the U.S. elections. You know, John, the swing states are really going to determine the election. So how do you see this playing out right now? The question for Israelis particularly is, do you want an extension of the Obama presidency and all that went with it, with the haranguing over building Jewish apartments in Jerusalem, uh, the question of whether the United States will really be there, the Iran deal, all these things that really went south for Israel in the last eight years. Israelis have to balance that out with the unpredictability of Donald Trump. And what, you know, he's gonna have the nuclear suitcase if he's elected president of the United States. And there are concerns on both sides. It seems now the polls, you know, favor Hillary Clinton just because it's, it, it's who they know. But uh, it's, it's going to have a big impact on this part of the world. There's no doubt about it, with either one of them being mm -hmm. elected. You know, I had, uh, we're talking at the Feast of Tabernacles. I was in a sukkah last night with some Israelis, and we had one person who say they want Hillary Clinton uh, because they're afraid of Don Donald Trump. Uh, Julie, you're here in Israel. What do you see about Israelis? How are they reacting to this? Yeah, I think, you know, for better or for worse, they liked Bill Clinton. And so they, they feel like Hillary is somebody they know. 
Um, I think, though, for Israel, in a larger sense, it's not just who, uh, how they'll be friends with Israel itself, but how they're going to deal with the rest of the region. Mm -hmm. And that is probably their biggest concern. How are they going to deal with Iran? How are they going to deal with the situation in Syria, which is right on the Israeli border? So those are the kind of the issues that are more um, security-wise, probably more concerning for Israelis. And John, final question to you. You talked earlier about the U.S.-Russia superpower. How do you see that happening or playing out here in the Middle East as well? The Russians are already filling a vacuum deliberately left by Barack Obama. Either candidate, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, is going to have a tough time reasserting, reestablishing that, especially when Americans are fairly war-weary and don't want to have an, uh, at least an investment of American troops in the region. So uh, if, if the U.S. continues to retreat under either one of them or allow Russia, then Israel has a whole new set of circumstances to deal with, and I think that's what the leadership in Israel is working on right now. Well, John, Julie, thanks for your expertise and analysis, and I'm sure we're going to be seeing the consequences of this election in the Middle East here and towards Israel for years to come. Coming up, hear the remarkable story of how one terror victim forgave her attackers. I had no money, I had nothing. I had only God's promise. now on the streets of Jerusalem with thousands of Christian pilgrims who have come here to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and participate in the Jerusalem March. We have a story to tell you now about a Christian woman who actually helped Arab foster children who was involved in a terror attack just about a year ago. Here's a remarkable story of how she's gone on after that attack. Marika Veldman left Holland for Jerusalem almost 40 years ago with a goal become a foster mom to Arab children. I had no money, I had nothing. I had only God's promise from Psalm 10 that uh, to take care of the, the uh, orphans. And uh, this is how I started my home in faith. I just rented a house and I, uh, I decorated it. And then after that, all the children came. This was over a time of 32 years, I was a foster mother. And I had about 20 children living, not all together in one time, but all these years about 20 children came to my home and they stayed for longer or for shorter time. Then one day her life suddenly changed when two men boarded the bus she was riding. The bus Marika was riding stopped at this corner. Two Palestinians from a nearby Jerusalem neighborhood boarded bus number 78 and began to stab and shoot passengers. Three Israelis died as a result of the attack. They looked so suspicious that I thought, why did the bus driver let them in? After that, they started uh, screaming, and the two were terrorists, and one had a gun and another a knife. So the man with the knife jumped on me, and then he started stabbing me in my shoulder, also in my chest and my hands. And the other one went to the back of the bus and started shooting. People started screaming, of course, but while he was stabbing me, I was saying in my own language over and over and over again, Oh Lord Jesus, I will say it in Dutch, Oh Heere Jesus, Heere Jesus, Heere Jesus. And I was protecting myself with my hands like this, and I was like very quiet. I kept very quiet sitting in the corner, and all of a sudden he stopped. And he went to the back of the bus to uh, continue with stabbing other people. All of a sudden I heard a noise and all the glass was broken and the door was just open so I could get out. Marika stumbled out of the bus bleeding and in shock. Still she managed to wave down a driver who got her quickly to an ambulance. She had six knife wounds and a collapsed lung. Many of her former foster children came to visit her in the hospital, but they didn't want to be interviewed on camera. One of the first questions my children asked me was, um, Mama, do you hate us now? And do you hate the Arabs? Because my children are all Arabic. And um, actually I was, how shall I express myself? I was flabbergasted that they would ask me these questions. 
And they said, no, children, how can you ask me this kind of questions? You know, I'm, I'm called for the Arabs and of course I don't hate them. I was so thankful when I walked out of the bus alive that I thanked the Lord. It hasn't crossed my mind for one second that I would hate the Arabs. So I continued and I said, um, I even forgave the one who stabbed me. And uh, they said, Mama, that doesn't make any sense. You know, how can you forgive somebody who wanted to kill you? And I thought, yeah, it doesn't make much sense, you know, to, to forgive a person like that. But then I thought, actually, the Lord, our Father in heaven, He forgave us through the Lord Jesus. And forgiving is also, it's a choice. I want to make the choice to forgive. And once you make the choice, then God comes to help you. That is His grace. So if you make a choice to forgive, then God comes in and He gives you the grace to do it. So this is what I explained to my children also. The whole experience, the whole horrible thing, it brought me closer to the Lord. He has proven Himself a wonderful God. We are serving a wonderful God. He is so good. That's what I have to say. Up next, cooking with the seven superfoods of the Bible. So we pour on our dressing on top, right? Welcome back to the streets of Jerusalem with thousands of Christian pilgrims celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. During this feast, many Israelis eat what is called the seven species of the Bible. CBN's Scott Ross had a cooking lesson along with his wife Nedra about how to cook these seven superfoods of the Bible. This is the city of David. My wife Nedra and I met a famous Israeli known as the Queen of Kosher and the Kosher Rachel Ray. She is Jamie Geller, mother of five and founder of the Kosher Media Network. How large an area does this encompass? It's an 11-acre area. This is Biblical Jerusalem, the City of David. And you'll notice it's outside of the old city walls, right? right? So the City of David, Jerusalem, Israel, it brings people together, it does. much like food. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to show you one of my favorite recipes, <laughs> the seven superfoods of the Bible and a special salad. How about that? Great. I brought Nedra along because she's the real cook in the family. She feeds me. She's a very good cook. But yeah. but we know nothing about kosher food and, and kosher cooking. Kosher refers to biblical and traditional Jewish dietary laws. They prohibit some foods like pork and shellfish and don't allow mixing meat and dairy products in the same meal. But we learned it's tasty all the same. The way that I cook is quick and kosher, okay? Right. So that means it's easy, anyone can do it, and all I need are people that like to eat. We love to eat. Can you do that? Can we, yeah. Okay, fine. And what's special here, forget about kosher, we're doing a recipe inspired by the seven species, the seven foods that are superfoods, superfoods of the Bible and of the land of Israel. Superfoods? Yeah. Will this make me a super person, man? It'll make man? you strong like Popeye, it'll make you healthy, your <laughs> doctor will be happy, your wife will be happy, you'll eat good. The seven species come from the book of Deuteronomy, which says the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Shivat Haminim, which translates to mean the seven species. So this is the Shivat Haminim salad. Okay, okay. fine. So we're going to start by our wheat that we're going to use is bulgur. So would you mind to help me, Adrian? Sure, what would you like me to do? Just, just put that right in here. In. And yes, into a hot pot, we're going to put a little bit of oil, just a touch. You make bulgur like you would rice. So you toast it up just a little, little bit in a hot pot. Now, okay. this is the magic of television, right? right. We got a finished thing right there. We okay? did it. Before we get to toss it all together, we're gonna make our dressing. So you wanna help a little bit, Scott and Edric? Here, we have olive oil. Okay, do you want the whole? Please, put it all in. Okay, this is a little Dijon mustard. That's Love just for a little Dijon. flavor, right? Loves mustard. Like right, that. okay, fine. Okay. So Dijon's good. Now, what we have here is one of the special foods of the lands of Israel. Date honey. Dates are one of the sweetest fruits in the world. Tons of fiber, that's what we're talking about, these superfoods. And date honey has been used for thousands of years to sweeten things naturally. A little red wine vinegar, right? Because okay. grapes and I wine, can do that. you can do it. We got a little bit of, right, salt and pepper. Okay, now we whisk. Who wants to whisk for we me? We can whisk. Okay, whisk, whisk it up. 
Well, Mr. Ross. Okay. Okay. Gorgeous. How long yeah, do you job. whisk? That's it. Yeah, it's good. Emulsified. Nice. So everything's emulsified. You don't want to see any chunks of uh, Dijon anymore. Yeah. So that just pulls that together. So now, before we assemble our salad, I just want to show you. Right. This is dry dates. Okay. And then no. you just slice your dates like this. Okay. Okay. So that's how we deal with our dates. You can use fresh or dried figs, but I just wanted to show you guys a little okay, bit of that. Good. Would you please, Scott, bring over the, the beautiful, this? beautiful serving yes. plate? Then we can set right. our bulgur, right, is going to right. be the base of our salad. Right. So we're going to put on our dates. They're a little, little sticky. So you'll excuse me, you want to help me? Okay. Okay. I put okay. in the grapes, the superfood okay. of the grapes, right? They've got lots of antioxidants. When pomegranates are in season, we would use the seeds of a pomegranate. Here we've got wow. our figs, another one, right? right? Right out of the Bible, onto our beautiful They look salad. like anchovies. Right, you said that. <laughs> That's not one of the superfoods, but no. if you like, we can put it on, you know? So we pour on our dressing. On top, right? Okay. And it's beautiful, right? It's a nice yeah, salad. Yeah, it's really nice. But now look at it. Boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. They think you the power the of a little hour. green. <laughs> yeah, totally. It looks like we worked hard on this. Yeah. How long did that take us, guys? Uh, five minutes. Okay, would you like to taste? Of course. Okay, so let's share this together, right? Okay. Shall we? A little for you. Okay. A little more, hearty. They've got a spoon over there. Okay. A little for you, Miss Nedra. Thank you, dear. I want you to get all Boy, of the superfoods. It smells nice, I, yeah. it's fresh. So shall we? Yes, we shall. Okay. God bless this and help me. Amen. Mmm. <laughs> Do you like? Mmm. It's different, mm. right? Enjoy, enjoy. I'm so happy that you like. And right now you're eating a superfood salad with foods from the Bible that's delicious and good for you. So like mm. that's like the best combination. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, I wanted to give you guys a present. Can I do that? Sure. Sure. Okay. I have a new book. Wonderful. Called Joy of Kosher, Fast Fresh Family Recipes. I may end up going so kosher, you never know. <laughs> well, you know what? You don't have to be kosher yeah, to right. love kosher. I so that, in theory, right, yeah. this was a kosher salad, but come on, it was right. delicious, right. you know? It looks beautiful. And there are lots of wonderful Israeli recipes in here, hummus, falafel, um, there's a, a lamb kebab spiced with cinnamon, oh, cumin. Right. And so don't be scared it's kosher, don't be scared it's Israel, don't be right. scared. You know, I try Italian recipes, I try Indian recipes, right. I try, let's do it, let's yeah. get together around food. We can Scott Ross, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, supporting Israel for such a time as this. Welcome back to the streets of Jerusalem with thousands of Christian pilgrims that, as you can see, are quite excited to be here in Jerusalem. But we've seen that many nations in the world are not so interested in what the Bible has to say about Jerusalem and Israel. For example, UNESCO voted twice that there was no Jewish connection between the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, and the Jewish people. Well, it's certainly a time, therefore, to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem because it promises that those that pray for the peace of Jerusalem will prosper. Well, thanks for joining us for this edition. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. And remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. God bless.